meeting. It's uh, planning board meeting for October 15, 2024. What's the pleasure of the board? We'll make motion we accept the meeting minutes from the meeting of 10 1 Second. Moved and second. We accept the uh, uh, many meeting minutes. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unanimous of four. You weren't here. I can still vote. It's only two. We're going to take the bond reduction uh, out of order because the town engineer has to go to another meeting. <laughs> So, Liz, you wanna? Uh, yep, so I went through, um, there's currently a bond for $242,227.75 for Walter Circle. Um, all of the work has been completed. It actually probably would have uh, been accepted at town meeting if the timing had worked out a little bit better. Um, so they are requesting a 90% uh, uh, reduction on that, which will leave $24,222.85 um, for any repairs that need to be made due to the, the winter. So I would recommend um, reduce, allow, uh, approving reduction of the bond. So moved. Moved. Second. Moved and second. We reduced the bond to to just twenty to ten percent, which is twenty-four thousand two hundred and twenty-two dollars. Yeah, so it's to, it's going to reduce it two hundred eighteen thousand four dollars and ninety cents. Right. Yep. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous of four. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. Ah, uh, you're on. That was great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good, Good evening, everyone. Josh Fiello with MAPC, Metropolitan Area, Area Planning Council. I'm joined by Michael Pierce, my colleague from the Municipal Services Department this evening. Uh, we're happy to be with you all again, ad hoc committee members, um, for our seventh meeting in our series for the Milford Comprehensive Plan. Um, this evening we have a, a briefer agenda, which I think should suit you all well after the holiday. Um, so we'll have a brief review and update over uh, what's happening with our fall community engagement. We have some updates on that, which is great. And have a community survey number two, which has been prepared, and we have a, a link which is live, and we'll begin circulating that at these meetings that I'll show you in a second. And then our, our focus uh, topic discussion for this evening is community facilities and services, which is Michael's uh, purview, and we are uh, we'll, as we have done in previous sessions, go through a series of slides with some data and information and then have a discussion with you all either, you know, as we go through the slides or afterwards and um, get on the same page, hopefully, about community facilities and services and then just briefly touch on next steps and we expect that that should be a little quicker than our last few meetings where we went in detail through the draft vision statement and the draft goals uh, so we won't be doing as much, uh, covering as much content this evening. Thank you all ad hoc committee members for your involvement in this process and dedication to it. We appreciate the time and carving out the time for each of these meetings as well. So we're continuing on the comprehensive plan timeline. We are at the cent, you know, approaching the center point of the fall session where we're really focused on those draft vision statement and draft goals, which you all saw and gathering feedback and ways to strengthen that content. And we have a, a series of, um, less formal meetings in this month of October, and then we'll have more formal uh, forums in the month of November to achieve that purpose. So just to give you a uh, view into the fall community engagement and a bunch of effort by our team to get these dates and uh, venues and uh, audiences established, 
So just to recall that we're still really focused on a few things in these outreach efforts. Building awareness of the plan, we don't anticipate that everyone is uh, fully aware that there's a Milford Comprehensive Plan going on and update on it. So we'll continue to socialize the plan uh, and then are, are specifically seeking feedback on these uh, draft content items which are in draft form and we hope will be improved with these conversations. So this, uh, these events are underway. Uh, we have had uh, one last week where we did a downtown block walk where a member of our staff and a member of the um, community, uh, which is a, a, I believe, Spanish and Portuguese uh, Brazilian speaking member of the community, went around to small businesses in the downtown and just invited their uh, curiosity about this process, but also invited them to a small business session, which will occur at the end of this month on the 30th, which will be held at the Chamber of Commerce. So we did, it was both sort of twofold, to have informal conversations in their businesses, but also to uh, invite them to the Chamber session. So that was a successful outing. Uh, our colleague, Camille Johnlin, who you, uh, I think many of you met when she presented to you all on economic development, uh, was there uh, walking through the downtown the small businesses for about two hours on the 8th, which was great. Uh, and she, had, she has taken notes from those sessions as well, which our team is benefiting from. Um, tonight, I dropped off on my way here uh, at the high school, Courtney, who you all know and I've met at previous meetings, uh, to uh, be a part of one of the adult English second language learner programs, uh, and that's in conjunction with what uh, Elizabeth just left for uh, for the MVP 2.0 process. Uh, so we're also uh, taking notes and involved in those uh, sessions this evening. We have on Friday an open session uh, for at the library, which will hopefully get people who are at the library anyhow, uh, kind of circulating there and can engage with them. Uh, but this is also an event uh, which we are um, promoting online through, um, we have a flyer which I'm gonna stick up in town hall uh, after the meeting here. Uh, so anyone that isn't gonna be at one of the other events, this is really more of an open call. We view it more as a open office hours where our members of our team will be present. And we can engage with anyone who's available in the space or stops by. We'll be doing a similar session at the library on the 30th of this month and that will occur more in the evening hours. So those two sessions in tandem, the ones that are highlighted in bold, are really just kind of open for anyone who's available at the library or open to anyone that stops by purposefully. Then we have a few other sessions which are more geared towards targeted audiences. Uh, those are the Senior Center. Uh, we have, uh, in conjunction with our meeting on Friday, we're gonna send over an individual who will be at the Senior Center to do sign-ups around 10, say between 10 and 11 or so. And that will be for a session on also on 1030 at the Senior Center that will be focused on uh, that population, the uh, senior population of the town. Uh, we'll have some of our transportation team there, and we'll be talking about any of the topics of the master plan, but, or the comprehensive plan, excuse me, but believe that there may be some uh, transportation concerns with that particular part of the population. And then we also have on the 29th arranged with the youth center a youth council meeting, which will be getting uh, direct opinions from their, their youth council on the comprehensive plan and whatever, whatever it is they are interested in, the youth of the town, and uh, be gathering their feedback on their ideas for uh, what the town would, what they would like to see the town uh, sort of work on uh, as they are growing up in the town, which will be an interesting perspective and a, a group which we have not heard from as much in this process today. So that's, that's very good. And then just to close us out, I touched on the small business session, but that will be on the 30th at the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the, the space is smaller there, so we uh, are trying to get people, that's why we went out and reached out to um, small businesses, because we want to have it focused on those uh, direct stakeholders in the business community um, and want to make sure that we fill, fill the available space with those stakeholders. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, so to participate at the Senior Center on the 30th, someone would have to sign up to do so on the 18th? Not necessarily. That's to, that's to help us get a feel for how many people <coughs> might be present okay. so we can better plan. It can be drop in? Yeah. Okay. Any, anyone who's available at the Senior Center on the 30th could attend the session. Thank you. 
So those are, I think, for the most part, that applies for any of the sessions. I would say, except for the youth council meeting, because there's certain sensitivities with meeting with the youth. We, our team is going to go through uh, this process of core reforms and, and things like that. So uh, we want to be protective of who's 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 in the room with the youth, and. Um, the small businesses, as I said, just because the Chamber of Commerce conference room is, is a smaller space. Very small. So we hope, we hope uh, through these sessions um, to help our team get a better understanding from you know, the average Milford citizen and what they'd like to see and, and integrate those uh, comments and thoughts into the planning process. We also have, um, as I've mentioned, this is the flyer that I'll put up out on physically, and I have extra copies if any of you know of a place that would be good to post it as well and would want to take a copy and put it, would be appreciative of that effort. Um, so this is primarily focused on the uh, library sessions, and people can also register for those if they see fit, but they do not have to, and they can just show up or be in the space if they're there already. And just to remind you all, we are also focusing on, we're trying very hard to get those details confirmed for this evening so I could share it with you all, but then also through this recording, share it out more broadly. But we have not gotten the date exactly confirmed yet. We believe uh, the date will likely be the 18th of November. Um, we're confirming that venue, which will be a hopefully an area church, which uh, we believe the both Spanish-speaking and Portuguese-Brazilian-speaking uh, population populations are um, would become more comfortable with than, for example, coming to town hall. And then there will be a complimentary and similarly set up uh, English-speaking session hosted via Zoom, which is a preference we heard from people at the last uh, public forum in uh, the spring. And that will likely land on November 13th. Those two might flip-flop depending on the dates, but those are likely to be the two dates that we're, we're landing on. And as soon as we get those um, confirmed, we will also put together a quick flyer, that flyer translated as well, so we can circulate those uh, to the populations that we're intending to uh, hopefully host at the uh, Spanish and Portuguese speaking session. In addition to all of that, we have put together a community survey, the second community survey of this process. And that is a pretty straightforward survey in which we um, have included the language of the draft vision statement and the language of the draft goals, and then have um, open comments for each of them. So we break it down paragraph by car paragraph as we went through it with you all on the vision statement and ask for any suggestions to strengthen those paragraphs as people would read through the survey, and they can just add their open comments. And then we ask a question in terms of the, the scale of their reaction to the vision statement, how it aligns with their, uh, what they would think would be the ideal vision statement if it's kind of headed in the right direction or needs a lot more work. And that will help us gauge um, how, how much of improvement we should be uh, doing as we make these refinements. And then we also have, uh, for each of the topic goals, a similar setup where the goals are repeated in the survey, and then uh, there's an open comment form for each of those goals. And people will have the ability to um, choose, select if they're interested in all the topics, or if they're just interested in transportation, then it will take them straight to that topic, and it will sort of expedite this survey process so people don't feel it's as cumbersome if they just want to give feedback on a specific topic. Just described this, um, which is on the screen now. And then we do have a link and a QR code which are live for the survey. And I would say the survey will be getting a few upgrades. It's live in English now. We're working on Spanish and Portuguese translations, which will be added into the survey as options that people can pull down as well. So as, as we are out and about at each of these sessions that we just talked through, we'll also be uh, promoting the survey and the QR code and hand that out so people can take it with them. If they don't have the time to speak to us then, they can at least give us feedback through that means. Any questions about how this is all shaping up for fall engagement? I think I think it's falling into place. We feel a lot more comfortable now than we did last month with more of the details emerging. <coughs> So we'll, we'll continue on that path. The 
I would say just in terms of how we're going to use that information, everything we collect over those sessions in the next month, we will compile as a kind of meta set of notes and uh, feedback information that we receive. We will share that back to you all probably we can probably start to share it back in the next session at the beginning of November just to give you an idea of the high-level ideas of what we've been hearing. Um, and then we'll compile that with the uh, November forum sessions and really bring you back a more substantial um, compilation of all, all that we've heard in the December meeting with you all. And at that point, the process will really begin pivoting uh, from finishing up refinement of the goals and strengthening them based upon the feedback, but then pivot strongly towards the more detailed strategies and actions which will occur, you know, populate underneath those goals. But we want to make sure we get the goals relatively aligned first before we do too much underneath them. All right. So next, we'll, uh, I'll hand it over to Michael, who will lead us through the community facilities and services, and then we'll uh, hopefully have a rich conversation. This is just to remind you all, actually, I've got a slide here. So we're zeroing in on the uh, final of the topics here. So we did housing last session. I think had a very good discussion about housing uh, together. Community facilities and services is this this, is this evening. Uh, next, I don't know if we ever closed the loop. I communicate with Larry, but I'm not sure if I heard a confirmation. We are planning on a November 5th yes. election date meeting. Okay, so that's good. So that will be cultural and historical resources. And we'll, most, aside from giving you the high level uh, review of the themes we're, see, we're hearing from the conversations this month, we'll be focused on cultural and historical resources. So it'll be a relatively light meeting again, which was the intention there and the, the sort of compromise doing it on the election day to keep us all moving forward. And then we would wrap up in, in the December session with natural environment and open space. And that would get us through each of the topics with a deep dive discussion, such as the ones we've been having. And tonight we're on community, community services and facilities, and I'll let Michael take it from here. Thank you, Josh. Uh, thank you, uh, committee members, for your time. Uh, my name is Michael Pierce, Municipal Services Specialist at MAPC. And um, the Community Services and Facilities chapter, uh, as the name suggests, covers a pretty wide swath of uh, both, both the town facilities and then, of course, the associated services that the town provides. Um, and so the chapter looks, uh, starts kind of high level at the, at the town as an organization, um, at the govern, you know, governance, communications. Um, so to just kind of start us off, you know, the town has about 1,600 employees uh, who report to 26 different department heads, as well as 28 elected and appointed boards, commissions, and committees. Um, and then there are nine additional elected officials. Um, and the major town facilities uh, include the town hall, memorial hall, the, the library, of course, the police station, uh, the Spruce Street and Bird Street fire stations, youth center, senior center, uh, the Vernon Grove and North Purchase Street cemeteries, uh, the wastewater treatment plant, and the transfer recycle station. Um, you need to, oh. add, you need to add one there. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, please. Water, the water treatment facility. Water treatment. Oh, gotcha. Sorry. The, gotcha. The, the town the, now owns the water department, so. Gotcha. No, we will we will certainly include that. Um, and I I should note. Um, I mean, please please feel free to, to point out anything you feel is missing. Um, but just due to the nature of this section, like, you know. It will not. It will not include every single detail, and so we will certainly be sure to be sure that we go into that in the actual uh, report. But that'll, that'll add on three more elected officials too. Oh, for the, for the, the the water commission. Yes. Right. Okay. I will I will double check, but I believe yeah, yeah. I believe that that's included within the twenty eight uh, boards. Okay. But I'll. I'll I'll confirm that. Do you want to put the schools as major town facilities, or? or oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, those. Uh, sorry, we'll we'll be discussing the school shortly. I, I had kind of kept them in their own uh, their own subsection, but those are yeah. very much uh, very much considered in this chapter as well. <laughs> um, 
but yeah so starting starting off with the uh, with the library I also um, I just want to note in terms of some of the statistics in this slideshow that um, as of as of the time I was putting together the existing conditions report that this was based on the 2023 uh, annual report was not published anywhere at least not, not anywhere that I could access yet um, and so and I know that that's up now so I just want to note that some of these stats need to be updated to the current year and that will certainly be done shortly I just didn't have time to do that before this uh, before putting together this presentation um, so uh, so starting with the library uh, built in 1986 renovated 2007 2008 um, it has a total collection of uh, approximately 1.6 million items uh, though that includes the electronic items I believe uh, physical items are closer to a hundred and 20,000, if I recall correctly. Um, the library served 75,000 patrons in 2022. Um, important to note that number increased significantly in 2023 as, you know, as we've emerged from COVID, I believe it was 112,000 last year um, and is open for 65 hours a week. Um, and of note that it serves as a regional library for nearby towns being the kind of largest library in the, in the immediate vicinity. Um, it served by two full, uh, 22 full-time equivalent staff, uh, consists of two librarians, six associate librarians, three supervisors, and a director. Um, it's governed by a board of trustees um, and is very heavily dependent on volunteers to run programs. Um, uh, speaking of that, there's the dedicated ESL classroom um, and additionally two community rooms, which we understand hold about 200 people. Um, and the ESL classroom hosts one beginner in, uh, two, sorry, two beginner and one intermediate uh, English classes, uh, which they note are in high demand. And again, that was as of 2022. I'm not sure if there's been a change in those class offerings in the most recent year. Um, we know that they are, uh, as of the last time we spoke uh, with the director, they are developing their next five-year strategic plan. My uh, understanding is that that was due to be completed in October. Um, I don't have the latest information if that's if that's been uh, completed, and perhaps you all you all know more on that. Um, and a lot of that focus was on downsizing the physical collection um, to kind of make more room and improve the works and work study spaces, which they noted were being more heavily utilized. Um, then, uh, of course, we have the uh, the senior center and the youth center. So we'll just go over those briefly. Uh, senior center opened 2003, um, serves approximately 700 residents a month um, through a variety of services, classes, prepared meals, uh, the Shine program. Um, I know the local AARP affiliate uh, operates outside of, out of the uh, the senior center, uh, and that the newsletter reaches about 3,000 households uh, per. Uh, per month. Um, and then, of course, the Senior Center van, um, which uh, we all had the great opportunity to ride on our, I think, our first town tour. Um, that provides medical and other in-town transit. Um, and the center also connects seniors to out-of-town medical transit to Boston or Worcester. Um, and uh, that, uh, that uh, the senior center is served by two full-time staff, five part-time positions, um, in addition to one social worker. And our understanding, and I, I believe this, this uh, information was as of late spring, that there were plans for a full-time program coordinator uh, to be added. Um, and there's also an on-site nurse uh, that visits twice per week. Um, and then, um, and then, of course, the the youth center housed in the in the armory opened in 1998, um, and underwent a five million dollar renovation funded by the town in 2016. Um, and we understand that there was grant funding in place for the remaining uh, media center renovation that needed to take place. And this was as of several months ago. Um, and the free after school program serves approximately uh, 630 youth with 140 daily participants, um, as well as a low cost summer camp with about 100 families participating. Um, 
and there are two food pantry programs uh, that operate out of there as well. And they have some some other auxiliary, uh, like the winter walking hours for seniors in partnership with the Senior Center. Um, and of course, rent out the, the space for private events. Um, and that's served by three full-time staff, four part-time, and also largely dependent on volunteers. Um, We'd heard uh, the need or interest in a, a full, uh, full-time full front desk staff member from uh, some of the, the folks uh, at, the, uh, at the youth center. Um, and then, sorry, so now, now we're into schools, of course. Um, and um, again, you know, I, I realize that there, there's a lot to cover in this in this section. So I just want to want to stress that um, you know this this certainly isn't isn't intended to be um, you know everything that we're including, but but just some of the some of the high points to to discuss. Um, obviously, Milford Milford has six schools. Uh, there are, and again, this data may be a year and a half um, old, but about approximately 354 teachers with 700 uh, total employees serving, uh, I think the number now is actually closer to uh, 4,520 some odd students um, with a student to teacher ratio of approximately 12.5 to 1. Um, which is slightly above the state average, slightly. I think the state average is about 11.9 to 1, so um, about half a, half a student there. Um, sorry, I lost my place here. Um, so I think um, probably the one of the most significant statistics um, is that there are, at this point, approximately 1,600 uh, English language learners uh, among the student population and, uh, and 170 bilingual staff. Um, and our understanding is that the number of, uh, of English language learners has increased by about five times over the past decade. So that's obviously a, a very significant number. Um, the uh, fiscal year 24 budget totaled approximately 75.4 million, um, with I believe about 46.8 million of that coming from state chapter 70 funding. Um, and I know that um, we've heard both from um, from members of uh, you know, from the school superintendent as well as I believe members of the school committee that. Um, you know the sort of ri the rising costs combined with the loss of the COVID era funding um, have, have you know been a concern. While while there haven't been any cuts in programming or staff yet, um, this sort of long long term fiscal situation is is at least of of some some concern and, and something to to take a closer look at. Um, and then um, on the uh, on the infrastructure side, um, we hear pretty pretty clearly uh, that the, the kind of most most significant pressing need was around Milford High School, um, and whether that will be uh, you know renovated or, or rebuilt and, and that process. And we know that. Um, uh, that that's both been identified as the top infrastructure uh, priority and um, that uh, it was successful uh, in applying for the Massachusetts School Building Authority um, for that um, feasibility study uh, this year to kind of plan out the, the future of the high school and what that will look like. Um, and that there is a, a committee in place now overseeing this the feasibility, feasibility study. Um, Going on to um, the, just oh, the consistent school was school was actually built in seventy three. Oh, okay. My apologies. Thank you for that correction. I there. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I was the last class to graduate from the old high school. That's why I know it that well. Gotcha. Okay. No, thank you. That yeah, might have I, been the, that might have been if you were looking at data. That might have been when it was originally supposed to open. Yeah, that, that or, we were or, or, or could have been like you know groundbreaking or so, yeah. some something like maybe it, the funding was appropriated. Opened, it actually opened. Gotcha. Okay. No, we'll we'll definitely make note of that. Thank you. All right. No, I appreciate that. Um, and um, and then on um, on public safety. Um, I think that um, 
So, I mean, just to start with, the, the police department uh, consists of 50 sworn officers, again, as of about a year and a half ago, uh, nine civilian dispatchers, and two administrative assistants. Um, I know in 2022, the department responded to 54,500 calls for service. Um, and my, uh, my understanding, I, I don't believe the 2023 report uh, provided the exact number of calls for service from the police department, but I, I recall that it is uh, consistent with the number for 2022. I believe it was over 50,000. Um, and that is a very significant increase from um, the number of calls in 2021 and in 2020, um, the 32,000 and 28,500. And so um, this is certainly, I think, an area of an area of interest. Um, I don't, at present, have a lot more details about, you know, that about that increase. What's that, what that has been attributed to specifically? Um, you know, obviously, uh, also significant difference in you know calls for service for for violent emergencies versus more you know more minor uh, infractions or issues. Uh, but that was definitely uh, that's that's definitely a, da a data point that uh, will require more um, more digging into, I think. Um, and then the fire department uh, consists of 45 uh, uniformed personnel uh, operating out of the two uh, the Birch and, and Spruce Street fire stations. Um, and the de department received approximately. Um, uh, 5,900 calls for service in 2022. Um, I believe that number is held uh, about the same for 2023 as well. Um, so that's kind of the, the brief overview. Um, and then we have um, usually in the chapter, and I, I apologize, this is not set up to, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this will be much larger on the page in the, uh, in the actual report in terms of the formatting. Um, I realize it's not that, not that easy to see right here, um, but it, this uh, includes um, most, if not all, of the town facilities, including town hall, all of the schools, the library, uh, the public safety uh, facilities, um, and then additional information on um, some of the, on, uh, the hospitals and medical centers and um, also, um, I believe, food access uh, resources as well. So grocery stores, um, drug stores, convenience stores, th those are all indicated in smaller, smaller dots that I realize are not very, very, very visible on this, uh, but will be, will be uh, blown up on the actual, um, in the actual report, and we can certainly uh, provide anyone who's interested a, a higher resolution image if you want to study that more closely. Um, and then going down to um, to water and sewer infrastructure, and um, I want to note on this map, um, my my understanding is that we have. Um, we have not received the, and correct me if I'm if I'm off base here, Josh, but I don't think we've received the data on stormwater infrastructure. Um, our, our understanding is that there may there may be some, and if so, then we will certainly incorporate that into our map as well. <clears throat> we've done he's done significant amount of work because of the uh, uh, pollution. Uh, requirements in, in the Charles River watershed, so there should be at least some some level of base mapping for the existing stormwater. I don't know how far it's gotten out, but there should, and I believe that's GIS. It's been compiled right. on GIS, so you should be able to get that from me. I think we have. I don't know if we have it, but I know that there's data available for the points, like culverts, et cetera. But I don't know if if the pipe system is mapped in the same way. You know, I don't know. I, I know we, that he has done the, the discharge points and stuff. I thought there was some level of, of data on, on the, the network itself, okay. but I could be wrong. So if that's as much as we got, that, that's where most of it, at least in a GIS format, would reside. Uh, either that or between that or what, whatever Liz may have available. Um, you know, certainly with the new subdivisions that went in over the past... 30, 40 years, the, the the network should be on the plans and may be available as, digitally as well. But. Okay. We'll double check that. Thank you. For sure. Thank you. Um, and then um, 
So touching touching briefly upon um, upon kind of water water sewer and stormwater. Um, so the uh, sewer department manages um, manages the sewer system, which serves approximately 95 percent of residents and businesses, um, with most of the remaining being being septic. Um, there are approximately 60 miles of sewer pipe, um, 10 pump stations, um, and then of course the wastewater treatment plant in um, in Hopedale. Um, the treatment plant was last upgraded in 1986, um, and it currently has approximately a four million gallon per day capacity, um, which I believe is I don't think that capacity has changed since the the previous um, comprehensive plan. Um, Oh, sorry, I just lost my place there. Um, so of note, over over 50% of the sewer pipes, um, again, circa 2022 at least, um, over 50% of the sewer pipes were um, were pre-1950, uh, largely largely clay pipes um, in in various states of um, of deterioration that have led to a variety of infiltration and overflow issues. Um, and um, we know that there have been been some efforts, like the the sump pump program, to, um, to kind of you know re replace those as as able. But uh, our understanding, at least, is that um, by by and large, uh, the the sewer pipes are still quite you know quite old and in in a, in a little bit of a of a state of deterioration. So um, certainly a, a high item of, of concern in terms of um, in terms of priorities. Um, Stormwater, uh, of course, is treated separately and uh, currently managed by the highway department. Um, I think that um, a number of uh, the town officials that we spoke to noted interest in hiring, um, in either hiring a stormwater engineer specifically to, to manage uh, to manage the stormwater system. Um, and I, I think a, a couple had, had raised the possibility of, of having that as a new department or utility. Um, obviously, a, a bigger lift than, than simply having a, an engineer position. Um, but I think that those are all um, topics of, of interest and discussion. Um, and we know that uh, recently the town has been very focused um, on green stormwater infrastructure projects. Um, and I think that has also been one of the, the driving impetuses for potentially having a, a dedicated stormwater engineer um, so that they're able to, to kind of have that specialization and focus. Um, and then, of course, the town uh, has to, to, you know, continue to meet the requirements of the uh, of the MS4 permit, um, and um, and that you know work continues on that. But um, that's another area where um, you know, again, potentially specialized staff might might be able to to provide uh, additional support, but. Um, yeah, and then um, transportation. Um, and so this is tra sorry, I didn't have room here, but transportation infrastructure is really the focus. The focus here, obviously, we have uh, our own our separate transportation chapter, but this is just kind of specifically on the on the infrastructure. There, there are approximately 240 miles of paved roadway, uh, 22 signalized uh, intersections. My understanding is that nearly all of those are fixed time intersections. Um, and we've certainly heard the need to upgrade uh, some of those signals, um, particularly through the downtown corridor. Um, I think that this, this uh, one. They're not fixed time. They may not be working and running fixed time because no one has ever gone to improve them, but the control is actually function okay. with, with, with loops and, and are capable. But if, if they're running fixed time, it's probably because they're broke. <laughs> which, gotcha. which is yeah, most of them most of them run by uh, through the downtown corridor they're all they're all they all have loops because they were all done as part of the, the last state program that went through and they then they were actually okay running. okay um, no. but yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking almost all of them there's very few in town that are, that are fixed that need to run as fixed time yeah 
there may be ones that are running as fixed time only because they've never been, the, the loops have broken and they've never been upgraded or whatever, but most of them are, they, the controllers do work. Uh, okay, okay, gotcha. Then we'll, we'll go back here. This, um, yeah, it's, it's possible that, that um, my information here is, is, is outdated. Um, well, I mean, the fact that they may need upgrading may be true, but uh, you know, just in terms that's of right. the state, the, the fixed time, right? Fixed gotcha. Time, that's a different story. Okay. Okay. I think of our, our working on that trigger kind of. Gotcha. Okay. No, we'll um, we'll go we'll we'll uh, we'll go back and, and make sure that we've got um, okay. we've got the most up to date information. Um, well, they're wrong with it. Because I know that I I know that that's that was a. Um, yeah, you may you may want to you may want to have that conversation with them again because uh, depending on when you talk to them or not, I think we've done one, Ricky. There's, there's been there's been money set aside to do to put cameras in at various intersections, mostly for accident, but they've actually done they've actually tied some of those cameras in to uh, to the controllers and they're using them. Uh, in place of the gotcha. detectors at certain spots. So that just happened at the last town meeting we, we had done that. So there has been some movement on improving the signalized, signalized intersections in town. So it probably would be good to have that conversation. That that would actually be through the police chief. Okay. Uh, as to okay. what he's done or hasn't done. Gotcha. No, we'll 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 certainly um, we'll certainly go back and review that. And I, I think some of some of what we were hearing, uh, I, I know, was from the fire department specifically on um, on concerns I don't know how about the comps and stuff. Uh, yeah, but so, I don't know how they're working or whether they are or not. But um, but we'll we'll make sure we'll make sure that we've got the um, yeah the, the, that we've got the most recent data on that. Um, and again, appreciate. Um, Appreciate your your input here. Um, um, yeah, so that kind of covers the next point. Um, and then we've also certainly heard uh, the just Im general improvement of street and sidewalk conditions um, has been identified as a, as a, a priority for folks. Um, the highway department leads leads the uh, street and sidewalk maintenance. Um, in 2022, they installed or replaced about 1,800 feet of curb, 2,000 feet of sidewalks, uh, 16,000 feet of berm, um, and 49 uh, streets and parking lots were uh, resealed, along with the uh, addition of 15 ADA accessible curb ramps. Um, and one one important point here that I, I wanted to note um, was that um, you know it's, it's cer certainly pretty typical to utilize uh, a PCI or pavement conditions index as a means of prior prioritizing things like street repair, resealing, um, and uh, as, as best we were able to find the most recent uh, PCI map, again, this was at least that is, that is publicly accessible, uh, was about 30 years old. Um, that does not mean that there are, are not more recent ones, but if so, we have not been able to, <laughs> to access those. Um, so we just wanted to highlight um, highlight pavement conditions index um, as kind of an important um, indicator and tool for the, the town to be able to prioritize that work. Um, Unless it was done within budget, there hasn't been any request since that time for a, for a pavement conditions at town meeting. Gotcha. I, I, if there was money in the budget, I can't tell you if, if the highway surveyor did it or not, but outside of it, they, it hasn't been done. Gotcha. Um, Okay. Yeah, that we just wanted to, wanted wanted to cite that since yeah. that's a, a fairly, um, you know, g given given that the pavement condition was raised as a priority, um, having that PCI would be a, a very useful tool for addressing that. Um, so, um, going on to just kind of the oh, sorry, um, um, some of the the major challenges. Um, we've seen, obviously, the growing need to increase language accessibility for both students and for all residents, um, given the, the significant increase in folks who may be non-English speakers or non-native English speakers. 
Um, and that is kind of, you know, across the board for, for all services. Um, facilities needs that we've, we've heard highlighted in addition to the ones that, that uh, I've gone over include um, space limitations at Town Hall. We've certainly heard quite a bit about that. Um, and then um, probably kind of addressing the, the high school and however that plays out. Um, as two of the, you know, maybe kind of b big ticket infrastructure needs that the town uh, town faces, um, and then uh, and then in, in other areas, obviously the um, addressing the the aging sewer system, um, and then addressing those the kind of traffic and transportation um, focus needs. Um, and again, we'll we'll certainly um, take another look at the the information we've received on the on the signalized intersections and make sure that that's the sewer. You may want to um, you may want to differentiate because the sewer sewer department um, runs on an enterprise fund, so they fund themselves. So if there's infrastructure that's aging. It, you know, right. that budget is through them, so it needs to, you know, as we do this, it needs to be made clear as to where that money's coming from or not. For sure, for sure. Same thing with the water department, absolutely. I believe, as we go no, forward. Absolutely. So, I mean, you just need to be aware of that if there's anything that comes up as part of the water department, too. They're both enterprise funds. Gotcha. Okay, yeah, no, du duly noted, and we'll make sure to, um, we'll make sure that we treat them as such. <laughs> so, um, Another um, another item that I that uh, we wanted to bring up uh, was just the general um, the general approach to the capital improvement plan and process. Um, and again, this is sort of go going based on what at least what is is publicly available. Um, the current capital improvement plan, I believe, was from 2019. Um, and I know that it's it's noted in the plan that it's to be updated on a yearly basis, on an annual basis. And um, to, to the best of our ability, we had not seen an updated version of that. You know, it did not seem to be updated since 2019. Um, certainly, if anyone has more more information on that, we um, would be would be happy to hear it. But. Um, I think that it also um, it was also worth worth noting that it, that it was a, a quite a, a cursory um, kind of short plan. I think it was I think it was between ten to twelve pages, um, and uh, you know did not um, did not go into a lot of depth on um, any of the any of the infrastructure that it discussed. Um, I think to complement that, though, there's a process that the department heads work with the finance committee, which I'm part of, and I'm on the capital subcommittee. We've got a multi-year capital plan um, where the department heads signal the things they're going to need multiple years in advance, and we're all, we, we meet with them around the calendar and keep that live at all times, right? So that supports, um, you know, it, in our fiscal planning process, there's a part of the year where we do capital, and there's a, a budget set aside for capital plans, and then, of course, things don't always fit in, and there's a process for how those would work, you know, if they, if they fall off cycle at the other town meeting. Um, so there's, in addition to what you see out there is that document, there is a you know, pretty robust capital planning process Discussion. that works with department heads. It's a, you know, it's a huge Excel spreadsheet that has a lot of departments and it's a multi-year plan that you know, lays out people's needs well in advance because we obviously can't afford people to surprise us with things you know, too much. You know? So you really need to have things you know, itemized out. If somebody needs a boiler, Five years out, it's on the plan. If they need a dump truck or if they need, you know, a leaf truck, five years out, like it's, it should be on the plan. And it, it has, a, I mean, things move, things shuffle because you know sometimes things break, and you have to deal with that, you know, as well. But there's, a, and then we can trade inside of the department's plans. Gotcha. Do you know is is that document publicly available, or that's a strictly internal? I'd be surprised if it's not on the website, but I can help you get it. Oh, okay. Th yeah. No, we definitely appreciate that. I. Um yeah, that. Um, so we just we have a new website, you know. So I might not right, maybe no it hasn't way. made its way, but in in, in the capital planning process, um, because it goes to town meeting, the town meeting members have to see these things. Sure. We try really hard to make sure that the there's a certain list of questions that are answered that are available for all town meeting members or residents to see. You can see the quotes that we got, and you can also see the plan, right? So we try to have that be very public. Um, maybe it's not as available as I thought it was with the new <laughs> website, and I haven't looked for it on the site because I get it through email, you know, pretty regularly. Each town meeting any project
project that's going to be looking for an appropriation it will be on a town meeting website so we under that section so as brand said you should be able to see what they're looking for how they base the cost of the appropriation they're asking for and that type of thing so okay you know, yeah well it we'll is there it. we'll take another look i i also yeah, I, I realize that in doing a lot of the research for the existing conditions report that it kind of straddled, uh, you know, when the, I think the new, the, the updated website went live, so what was it, sometime in, in May or June. Yeah. Um, That's all right. We'll talk, we'll go offline. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, can, we can certainly connect on that. But no, ap appreciate that. Um, and um, yeah, and, 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 you know, again, maybe, maybe, um, you know, maybe, maybe 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 that's an area where uh, you know it, turn, it, tur it turns out that there is there is enough publicly available information, uh, but just kind of as it as it stood from what we were able to find, we felt that that was um, an important area to to highlight. Um, and then finally, just um, you know, again, because this you know this is the kind of broad broad chapter to to talk about it. Um, I think just the just the general challenge of rising costs to maintain you know a consistent quality of service um, and how the town chooses to address that you know obviously inevitable trade-offs between between revenue and service levels um, you know I, I realize that um, you know this can this can be a you know, a, a politically fraught minefield, uh, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, our, our uh, job obviously isn't, you know, isn't to try to, to force the town into any one, you know, solution, but just to be thinking about, thinking about those inevitable trade-offs and challenges and kind of what the, you know, what the long-term sustainability of its current service levels is how will how will the town meet those challenges um, and um, and really just kind of have that you know obviously it is uh, you know it's it's on the town to, to decide the best ways to meet those needs but um, but we we just want to highlight that kind of inevitable challenge that will that will continue going forward so as we our, our department heads work with each other and you know there's grant knows there's still still hold off on on something because they need money somewhere else the fire department has kicked back a number of times on uh, uh re, re, do, renewing their engines and and doing that just to to work with the with the kind of the finance committee does a great job working with them. Yes, I think it, I, I appreciate the kind words that we certainly try pretty hard and we, you know, even if you think about, we talked about a school coming, you know, so we are actively thinking about making sure we have stabilization funds for that and have room against the tax levy and with some taxpayer relief, which we're always trying to be ahead of this. But I think what's interesting to me in this part of the document, when you, when you get even more granular, is to distill uh, the challenge into inflation versus rising population and service needs, right? So you know, Chris was very quick to say schools are going up. When you said, hey, 50, because right, right. the schools have been on the way up and the Chapter 70 money's been up because of the needs and the changing needs of the student base. So if you think about us, if you looked at our history over the last decade, let's say, you'd see a huge raise, uh, increase in the number of students and the English learners and high need students, and then the Chapter 70 money has gone up a lot with it. You'd also mention the fire department and the police department, the number of calls have gone up. So there's two different things kind of happening. One's sure. inflation, and I'd love to be able to have this conversation distilled inflation as separate from increased population and increased need because I see those as having a lot of sort of you know, tentacles to it. So some of the increased need comes with extra funding, historically. And we've, we've, if you look at our Chapter 70 history, you'd see that we've gone up quite a bit because the state's recognizing that we have needs, very appropriately too, by the way. For sure. And I... Um I, I don't have all all the numbers quite memorized off the top of my head, but I and um, but I think, for example, like the Chapter 70 funding um, has increased somewhere on the order of maybe about 15 million over the past uh, over the past five years or so, and I think that the total budget for the schools has gone up. Uh, 
you know, be, beyond that, I think it's closer to, to 20 million, but I, I again, I, I don't have those numbers perfectly memorized, but um, so I think that's that's one case where there, there has been an increase, but there, you know, there, there are still challenges as well in terms of keeping up with the total needed budget, but. Um, but but no point point very well taken, um, and um, and 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 yes, obviously there's a there's a distinction to be made between, you know, b between the just general <laughs> general rate of inflation and um, and the and the specific you know increases in needs for specific services, um, and you know we'll we'll be happy to to kind of. Uh, Bifurcate that in our analysis as well to the to the degree that we're we're able to. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, we can go to right. So um, so I think again these are these are our sort of initial draft level goals. Um, we we had highlighted improving and updated the capital improvement processes and practices, but again we can touch base offline uh, about this the specifics of that and. Um, and there, yeah, there there may be more that that I I just wasn't able to ascertain from what was what I was able to, to find on the website. Um, I think um, continuing to evaluate current department structures and organization for efficient delivery of services. So you know, talking about things like hiring the stormwater engineer versus. You know whether whether there's interest in creating a new department for that or a utility. Um, uh, looking at um, looking at other areas where um, you know, that that we've heard interest in say. Um, uh, you know, having some joint like grant writing positions between, say, the youth center and the library and the senior center. Um, you know, th those kind of potential potential areas. Um, I think also uh, I would just raise, um, and I, I know that some folks have raised uh, the idea of having a consolidated Department of Public Works. Um, you know that that oversees all of the, the you know kind of centralizes the the capital and infrastructure and facility needs for the town um, has been something that's been discussed and contemplated and so that would kind of fall fall under that that recommendation um, continued or that goal sorry uh, continue to improve inclusivity and ex uh, and equitable access to town resources. Um, and so that that can include whether whether that's looking at you know the sort of town hall specific resources. I know we'd heard um, interest from some of the I think some of the immigrant uh, focus groups in having something like a you know like like a, a, a bilingual uh, kind of liaison for town hall, um, and some of those some of those. Uh, you know, kind of non-native non English speakers um, had had identified a variety of challenges, or what they felt were challenges to um, to kind of accessing town services. Um, then um, again, continuing to improve uh, environmental sustainability and resiliency uh, for town facility services and residents. Um, obviously, a, a pretty broad one. Um, but one that will will continue to be important, and I think uh, you know ties into uh, things like uh, the need to repair the sewer infrastructure, as certainly a, a, a kind of high level one there. Um, the need to um, again be able to to you know whether whether it's through hiring that stormwater engineer or some other some other process, um, ensuring that the town has the the kind of staff resources it needs. To um, to uh, focus on on green stormwater infrastructure, um, and then finally continue to plan for long term financial resiliency and sustainability. Um, and again, just kind of tying into into the various challenges around increased service needs, around inflation, um, and and uh, being able to plan out <laughs> for that. Um, 
so that that's about everything that that I've got. Um, so just some questions for for you, and and I know that obviously folks have have already shared quite a bit, but. Um, but you know, just kind of any, anything in particular that strikes you, any areas uh, you know beyond the ones we've discussed that, that you'd like to see us focus on or dig a little more into, um, and what else should be part of that kind of long-term vision and goals for community services and facilities. Um, and again, I, I realize that we've covered a, a lot of different topics here within that. Um, you know, I feel like any 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 one of them we could delve into a lot more. Um, and certainly happy to, to hear your thoughts and priorities. Um, Just one minor thing. When you go, you mentioned that the maps were kind of small. When you go back and work on the, on the map of, particularly with the schools, just take a look at it. looks like a couple of schools have sort of floated off their locations. So when you look at them, they're like, they're not actually where they are in real life. Oh, okay, gotcha. It's yeah, pretty small on it, but I used my iPad to zoom in. And like, mm. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> it's a minor thing, and you can, we, can, we can help you offline with it, but... Okay, no, we'll, we'll definitely make sure to, <laughs> to get that. that. Thank you. You should have that right. <laughs> Thank you. The, uh, I just had a couple of them. Uh, the, police, the police department, fire department, the number of calls and stuff. Did, were you able or do you think you're able to, going back to them, have the ability to uh, um, maybe compartmentalize those to try to get an idea of where those are? The only reason why I'm asking that, I mean, we... We spend, and I'm just looking at the, the number of fire calls, we spend a significant amount of money on on vehicles. And depending on where those are, you know, the, the, the traditional, to me, the traditional fire department, I think of how many fires we now have as to how many calls they go out for for different reasons and, and what the traditional fire department looks like as opposed to what it may need to be as we move forward. To me, it, it, it would seem like smaller vehicles that, that provide certain types of equipment that may cost less than the traditional truck may be more appropriate as we move forward. And I'm not sure that that's, that may be different with the police department. I mean, maybe some of those calls are, are such that they don't need to take a, a Ford Explorer out with all the equipment that's in there, but they need to get somebody out there. So just to know what the types of calls are, I think, could be a uh, could certainly be something that we would want to know moving forward in, in terms of how we fund those departments. I think it's a good, I think it's a good call for for anybody who's listening and interested, there was actually a, in the last year or so, there was actually a request from the fire department for a small, an extra smaller truck for the same reason. But you're, you're, you're right. There's a lot more rescue calls, and you don't necessarily need to bring you know, the, a full fire truck, everything. And the department has been trying to pivot to that over years. But this would be a great opportunity to explore you know, how other towns approach it and for this and for the, the, the police department. And well, it's also we certainly as a plan as we move forward, considering this is probably going to be with us for 20 years, sure. what we're trying to get to. Totally agree. The police chief and the fire chief can provide you with the breakdown, especially the fire chief. He can give you uh, what were more emergency response calls as opposed to going to fight a fire or something gotcha. of that okay. yeah, no, so If no. you reach out to Mark and, and, and Chief Ticino, the police chief, I'm sure they can get you started on breaking those numbers down uh, to give you a better idea of how many calls uh, and the nature and the type of calls. For sure. Um, and they downsized on their last rescue truck. It's much smaller than the... Uh, and the Especially the specialized built one. The ladder truck. That yeah. we had before in the ladder, well, the ladder truck is. Yeah. That's, that's in a lot of that technology with the ladder truck. Yeah. They've, they've downsized those in size, right. but they're still able to, to get the same. Yeah, would you rather put the miles on a smaller truck that costs No, that's what I'm saying. Right? Yeah, that's, so what I'm, that's what I'm looking at. And same thing with the police department. I mean, you don't need to send a cruiser that size out. Maybe it can be a normal car, right? You know? There's a lot of equipment that goes in there. Is it needed for every call, or is there a more appropriate way? I, I'm not saying there is. I'm just saying it's something to look at. So the other one that I had was ju just a question. I was looking at the sewer department, and it says that 95% of the businesses and residents are, are on sewer. I was just somewhat, it may be right. I was just wondering where you got that number, because it seems slightly high to me, knowing where, knowing the extent of the sewer. I, was, I, I believe, I believe, and I, I would need to go back and double check. I can, I, I can certainly, you know, provide you with that. But um, 
I think that was from one of the um, annual reports. Um, I can, uh, you know, I, I will, I will double check that though. And it, if, may, it, it, you know, it may be right. I'm just thinking in terms of area. I know it's not 95 percent, but the area that's not sewer tends to be large house lots. So it, it may be right. I'm just somewhat surprised. I didn't think it was quite that high. But okay, no, we'll we'll, we'll definitely double check that. Yeah, I, I believe it was from one of the annual reports, but I'll. Um, I'll yeah. go back and make sure that that's you check with the sewer department too yeah. uh, like uh, the, uh, the the pipes the uh, clay pipes they're talking about buying their own equipment to reline the, the pipes and everything to oh, save okay. the town money and do that so I mean it's if you talk to these gotcha. if you talk to these department heads they're going to tell you a lot more than that annual report is sure sure that's for sure <laughs> Yeah, just, just in terms of that, just to touch base on outreach to department heads. So our team did an initial round of interviews. I think we interviewed maybe 20, 20 plus, 20, somewhere between 20 and 30 um, of the municipal department heads, community heads, et cetera. We do plan to do a second round of those types of interviews with the um, goals, especially when we start getting, the goals are a little more set and we start getting down into strategies and actions, just because they'll, they'll know best what does or doesn't work, so we can ground truth all that with them. And if you go to the sewer department, 1984, if you look at it right now, it looks like it was built last week. Hmm. Maintenance. It's, uh, it's it's got to be the cleanest sewer plant. <laughs> but this is, this is, again, that's maintenance. Uh, and preventive maintenance is the most important thing. Um, okay, yeah, no, we'll, we'll, definitely, uh, we'll definitely circle back around on that. Um, the, the way that stat's written, too, is focused on the population, not the land area. So I agree, like, it doesn't look like 95% on the map, but it might be... 95% if you look at the density of the areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when you look at, you know, the uh, goal of continuing to evaluate the current department structure, so, you know, as this process goes along you get to the final report, do you look at saying, all right, it would be in Milford's best interest to create a, you know, a, a municipal department? Is that what the intent would be, or would the intent to be just saying you, you know, you could or you couldn't? Like where's, I'm just kind of curious on where, where that recommendation goes. I think I think that's a tough one. I think most we're, we're not trying to like hit a hornet's nest with a with a bat in, in this particular topic. So. I think what we're responding to are what we've heard from a lot of interviews. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think those, like D a DPW department for ha has been one of the examples. And I think we're still, we're still weighing yes. how, how so to Yes, so that respond. goal is just based off of, yes. of community input and not necessarily driving into looking at those departments and seeing where they're, where they're most efficient and where they could improve on their efficiency from a, from a um, consolidation. So if that is not the goal, then I understand that this is just driven off of what town's folks are sure. saying. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, um, well, yeah, towns folks and, and, and staff. I, I think yes. some of this is from staff, staff as well. Staff. Yeah. And, and staff. And I would say, yes, yeah, so we're not doing a sort of detailed benchmarking of each department relative to, like, best practices or, or something like that. But I would say, based upon what we're hearing and what the strategies are, we, we are thinking about potentially what the context is in some other towns similarly sized, for example, what they do. And if, if Milford is an outlier relative to those practices, we can point that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And that definitely can, can inform a decision. Yeah. 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 I just didn't know how far. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, it's, how it's, far is the detail you would go? That's yeah. all. Yeah, I, I would, for something like that, I mean, I would expect you to probably be in the Milford could look at something like this. Yeah. However, to make that decision, I think yeah. it would go in, you know, to make it, that decision properly would need to go into much deeper analysis than, than this is meant to do. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think you're going to be giving specific recommendations like that. That wouldn't be my expectation from where I sit anyway. Yep. Understood. And that's, yeah, I think we're on the same page. Thank 
Yeah, you're going to be more setting goals that could be that could be completed and not necessarily. Right. Well, because then, yeah. the goals, and again, I understand what you're doing with the goals, but the goals they are setting would cost about three billion dollars by the time <laughs> <laughs> if you implemented them. Yeah, I think this this particular chapter is a tough one for a few reasons. That number, the first reason is that. We're trying to get a view into a, a world which many people around this table have many, a better feel for all the details of what's going on in the town. Um, so we're trying to see where a process like this can step out and back from those details and look at that 10-year horizon and maybe give you something on the radar that might not have been there otherwise. But it's also, this is a topic where it's as much, you know, the local politics and sensitivities as it is about like the technical analysis whereas some other topics are more about the technical analysis and so we, we're I guess additionally cautious in this topic area because we don't want to cause issues where there where there might not be an issue by someone seeing something in a report like this that was more about our trying to understand the local context as opposed to um, I, you understand what I'm saying. But we, we, we're not trying to create problems. You know, like my five-year-old grandson figuring out what, what he wants for Christmas. <laughs> Already. It's not even Halloween. <laughs> Other thoughts or questions about what we presented tonight? I got This one's off, somewhat off topic on that, but just happened... Um, and I don't know how involved you are, Josh, with, I, I noticed there was grants available through the, I, I guess you could call it the TAP program from MAPC. Yeah. And I was just wondering if along the way, um, what you are feeling is, that are there areas that Milford could apply for that grant based on what we're seeing and what you're seeing in, in doing this plan? Um, you know, I just happen to notice that, and if there is something, then you know, through Rick or whatever, if there's money that to be had that can help us further certain areas of this plan outside of what we originally um, were planning on doing, that may be something that we would want to look at. Yeah, yeah, we, we very much agree with that. I think that one of the things we like to see in terms of the grant making that our agency is able to do is what we call implementation. So it's actually following on a comp plan like this. And if we have recommendations, for example, in the, the downtown or recommendations around zoning, things that are within the sort of technical purview of our agency and expertise of our agency, we would be, you know, I think we'd look very favorably on the application from Milton in the next grant cycle or, or the next, next grant next cycle. Next one after, the, after we're done with this? Yes, exactly. Okay. So that would be... Uh, there'll be recommendations in our uh, write-up about very specific things that the town could do on, you know, zoning a certain area or something like that. Then you could follow on, apply for that grant, and I think be in a very good position to get that grant as an implementation of this plan. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, the, the timing, not impossible for this current cycle, but the timing would be a little... Our, the more detail of our recommendations like that will begin to emerge yeah. towards the end of this year, but yeah, if, if there's one that's really, not be, yeah. if it's very clear and well supported, we could probably think about an um, application for this cycle, but next cycle I think would be a little clearer. Okay. okay. All right, so let me just wrap up, uh, follow up on some next steps. So. Yeah, and if people are interested, we, we do have an email list sign up that people can take a look at. Also, the, the plan website, we continue to try to keep updated and up to date with all the various meetings and activities going on. So that's a resource for everyone. This is the more complicated uh, version of all the moving parts, which we're keeping track of. Um, and I think mostly uh, tracking well with in terms of the overall approach. Here's our, our more bulleted next steps. So we'll be continuing to refine the goals based upon the discussions that are happening this month, turning toward initial strategies as those begin to get firmed up, and then also thinking about the improving the draft vision statement, which is a part of that work. Our next ad hoc committee meeting with you all will be November 5th. Uh, that's the evening of Election Day. 
at 7 p.m. in the space, and we'll primarily be focused on uh, historical and cultural resources. And again, it will be this, this session tonight qualifies as a relatively short one compared to some of our others, so it'll be a similarly uh, timed session where we'll focus mostly on historical and cultural and have a little bit of the initial findings on the feedback to bring back. So that's what we have for you this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Make a motion to adjourn. Is there something else on you? Second. Move to the second to adjourn. Any further discussion? Usually don't hear. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye